One of the activities underway at Indiana University is the development of a course in American political behavior. This two-semester social science course provides an alternative approach to existing high school courses in civics and government. The lesson you will observe is drawn from Unit 3 of this course, a unit entitled Elections and Voting Behavior. It, has, it is an illustration of a rule example lesson that is based upon inductive reasoning. The students will be asked to infer relationships of social characteristics to political behavior on the basis of statistical information. The ninth grade students in the demonstration are from pilot classes using the American Political Behavior course in Bloomington and Martinsville, Indiana. The teacher is John Patrick. In this lesson, we are going to use statistical data to make conclusions about the behavior of American voters. The question that we are going to discuss today will be presented on the screen. It says, using the information provided in statistical tables, what conclusions can you make about the relationship of the following eight social characteristics to political party choice. Now we'll take a look at the eight social characteristics that we're going to use in our discussion. They are, as you can see, socioeconomic status, occupation, place of residence, sex identity, racial or ethnic identity, educational attainment, age group, and political alienation level. Now we're going to look at three statistical tables from which you will infer generalizations using those social characteristics. The first table shows you the percentage of votes by groups in presidential elections from 1952 to 1964. The second table concerns the relationship between social class and political party choice, as you can see. And the third table also tells us something about voting choice, political party preference, and socioeconomic status. Now you've had a chance to look at those tables to refresh your memory, and you've had a chance to previously study those tables in your homework assignment. I'd now like to start the discussion by asking you to make a relationship between that first social characteristic, socioeconomic status, and political party preference of American voters. What do the tables tell us about that relationship? Nick, would you like to begin? Um, <clears throat> in general, the higher the socioeconomic status, the greater the tendency to vote Republican in most cases, and the lower the socioeconomic status, the greater the tendency to vote Democratic. Uh, Terry, do you agree with him? It, it seems so because um, on table 14 it says that the poverty class, which would I bet, guess be high socioeconomic status, has 11% Republican and 2% Democrat, and middle class has 50% Republican and only 29% Democrat. Mm -hmm. Ernie? Well, this holds true for everything except the farmers, which are uh, dominantly Republican. In 1952, 33% of them voted Democrat, and 1952, 33% of them voted Democrat, and 67% voted Republican. Okay, would anyone care to disagree with the statements that have been made about the relationship between socioeconomic status and political party choice? Yes, Dave. Well, someone said that uh, the higher uh, socioeconomic status uh, you tend to vote Republican, 
Mm -hmm. Well, in 1964, uh, seems like almost ev every group voted uh, Democratic except for uh, the uh, no one Republican. Mm -hmm. How would you respond to that, uh, Barb? Uh, wasn't that the Goldwater and the Johnson election? Mm -hmm. So uh, many people switched over to the Republican. People that normally voted Republican uh, decided, in this case, to vote against Goldwater. Mm -hmm. Tony? This also was right after Kennedy's death, and many people were still feeling it. And so I don't think this year can really be taken into account, because mm -hmm. it was just kind of unusual circumstances for the election. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, Rick? I think you can kind of put it all together and say, well, in that election, kind of outside influence and everything um, influencing them, and you can't conclude that in general. Mm -hmm. Um, estimates of voting privileges. Mm -hmm. And perhaps like Nick and Ernie and Terry did, we can refer to table 13 and 14 to see very clearly how those relationships were established. Perhaps we can sum up this part of the discussion by uh, repeating the conclusions that you made and looking at the slide on the screen, which shows that individuals of upper socioeconomic status tend to prefer the Republican Party, as Nick and Ernie and Terry showed uh, was established by the statistical tables. And Individuals of, of lower socioeconomic status tend to prefer the Democratic Party. Let's move to the next social characteristic that was on our list, the characteristic occupation. Can we use the tables to enable us to make a relationship between occupation and political party choice? Chuck? Oh, well, <coughs> it shows that the professional and business uh, men tend to vote Republican until you get down to the farmers and they uh, vote Republican. Mm -hmm. The uh, white collar workers and manual laborers and everything, they vote Democratic. Mm -hmm. Terry? I would disagree with the white collar because most of shows here on the table, that, table 12, that most of them vote Republican. Mm -hmm. Is that what you said, Chuck? Um, uh, I mean, yeah, would you agree with it? Oh, okay, yes, you, you would agree with Terry. Yeah. Tony? Well, it seems that the white collar goes very much like the professional in business. It's just, you know, I can't see the difference, really. And they tend to vote a Republican except in the year 1964. Mm -hmm. Bill? Uh, they seem to change with um, the type of job you have, like the amount of money you are making or something like that. And um, the people that are making, you know, more money in professional and business occupations tend to be Republican while they're um, lower um, money-making jobs like manual workers. Um, tend to be democratic, and it, um, then the ones in between that can uh, more or less go either way, except the farmers, which are also um, Republican because they're uh, more or less conservative. Terry? Well, you can link uh, what Bill said uh, to the fact that the people of higher social e economic status vote Republican and those of lower Democrats. So okay, perhaps that's a good place to stop this part of the discussion of pointing out that there's quite a linkage, as Terry indicated, between the socioeconomic status generalization you just made and this generalization that you've made about the relationship between occupation and political party preference. Let's sum this part of the discussion up by looking again at our screen. And we said that the tables show that individuals of professional business and white collar occupations tend to prefer the Republican Party. Likewise, the tables also show that manual workers tend to prefer the Democratic Party. Let's look at the third social characteristic on our list, place of residence. What do the statistical tables tell us about the relationship between place of residence and political party choice? Can you help us with that one? Uh, hey. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any table that shows uh, what uh, party they prefer. They really can't make any conclusions. What do you say, Ernie? Oh, um, you can make a few conclusions that uh, the place of residence of uh, most of the upper um, socioeconomic class people is in the large cities, and uh, it ends up the uh, other people usually live in the rural areas, except for the farmers, which is dominant. And uh, most rural areas is largely dominated by. And so I would tend to say that. Uh, well, I guess a lot of Democratic type people would also live in the large cities because um, you know, they have functions like a factory or something like that. So I tend to say that 
tend to say that uh, rural, rural cities are more likely to vote Republican and larger cities are more likely to vote Democrat. Mm -hmm. Nancy? Well, I think that if you live in the slum areas, uh, something like this, or if you live on a farm, that you're more, more likely to vote Democratic. And if you live in, in a big city in a nice apartment or a good house, I think you're more likely to vote Republican. So I think residents have something to do with it. Mm -hmm. Barb? Well, first of all, the farmers tend to vote Republican. That's why I don't understand how you can get any conclusions because you don't have any kids. Okay. Well, if you can't apply the um, where it's white and non-white, you might consider the non-white as more or less representing the South and the white is the North. And if you do that, then the South goes Democratic most of the time and the North is generally Republican. Dave, I'm going back to you. Tell me the difference between the kind of discussion we're having right now and the kind of discussion we had a moment ago about the relationship between occupation and political party preference. Well, a basic well, difference. What is that difference? Well, before we had, uh, they were proven facts, but now they're just value judgments. People's well, own opinion, they? really. Is that what a value judgment is? Yeah. The, how they evaluate the material, really. Uh, Terry? They could be generalizations, too. Well, all of these are generalizations. Yeah. Barb? Okay, we're speculating rather than making a hard and fast conclusion based on data. Because as you pointed out earlier, Dave, we really don't have any clear-cut data about the social characteristic place of residence. Barb also pointed that out. And the kind of commentary that you have to make is highly speculative based on clues provided in the data, but not hard and fast facts. All right, let's move on to the characteristic racial or ethnic identity. And uh, what relationship can you make about the relation uh, about uh, racial or ethnic identity and political party choice, Tony? Well, the white vote is Republican and the non-white vote is uh, Democratic. Through uh, well, up to the year I think 1964 again. Would you agree exactly with her statement, Terry? Yeah. Well, it seems that the white uh, follows the majority, which it should be because they are the majority. But the non-white tend to go very strongly democratic. Mm -hmm. All right. Would you agree, basically, then, with one half of her statement that non-white, in this case mostly the black people in America, would tend to vote democratic? But would you agree with the other part of her statement that the white people tend to vote Republican? No, I, I think the white people tend to follow the um, uh, normal. Uh, like in '64, the whites went for um, d went Democratic for Johnson, and uh, they went for in '56 overwhelm overwhelmingly Republican for Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. Barb? Well, um, according to this, it's kind of a I mean, yeah, it's kind of a '60-40 sort of thing, but they had the whites as being our voting tendency to vote Republican. How about the year 1964? Well, then that's an exception. Oh, yeah. it is? Yeah, well, okay. yeah. Next. <laughs> well, um, in general, in three out of four cases, the whites have voted Republican, but it hasn't been a great majority voting Republican. It has been just slightly over ma uh, majority voting. Okay, I think we can terminate this part of the discussion by saying, yes, there is as we can see in the slide on the screen, quite a relationship between being Negro and tending to vote for the Democratic Party. And that's indisputable given the statistics. I don't think we can make a hard and fast relationship be between being white and voting for either political party. So this is a relationship that uh, we'll establish. Let's move to the next characteristic, educational attainment. What kind of relationship can you make based on the data between that characteristic and political party choice. Lisa? Well, so, like higher education attainment if you voted Republican in 1964, maybe you voted Democrat, and then uh, after you have four cases, you voted Republican now. Mm -hmm. Nancy, would you agree with her? Yes, I'd agree with her, and I don't think that, well, most of them did vote Democratic, but it wasn't that terribly um, away from the Republican Party. You mean in 1964? Right, that's good to point out because in 1964 everyone seemed to be going Democratic, but the college educated people were going Democratic in less uh, preponderance 
than other groups. So that's a good point to make. Terry. I think the people that are in have college education, usually the Republican, as has been said, but the high school and grade school people that have, have only that attainment, kind of, they don't, there's not very much variation. Some folks, it's really pretty close in the percentages. Would you agree with that, Tony? Yeah, I agree because, well, in high school and grade school, they didn't have, you know, the college to go to. And mm -hmm. But they didn't have all the activities they didn't start getting involved in. They, they started uh, having to live a life and all earlier, and mm -hmm. they didn't have a chance really probably to get into it. And I think the high school and the grade school, they're real close. You know, it kind of goes year to year, back and forth. Let's take a look at the grade school group. What seems to be the relationship between only going this far in school and voting preference, political party choice? Look at the grade school group across the four presidential elections, and what do you conclude? Chris? Well, they tend to be all democratic, except 1956, they're divided, but generally they seem to be all, always democratic. And compared to other groups? Um, they're well, they're more so than the high, the high school kind of divided, and they're much more so democratic than the college group. Okay, perhaps we can conclude that portion of the discussion then by looking at the generalizations on the screen that reflect what you've said based on the table. The college graduates tend to prefer the Republican Party, and that individuals of lower educational attainment, which is the next slide, individuals of lower educational attainment tend to prefer the Democratic Party. Let's move to the next social characteristic, which is age group. Can you make any relationship from this data about age group and political party choice? Bill? Uh, well, according to this table, it seems that, um, that younger people tend to prefer the Democratic Party, and then as they get older, they have a tendency to switch over to the Republican Party. Would anyone care to disagree or agree with him? Karen. Well, it seems particularly in the 1664 election, there wasn't that much difference between 20, 21 to 29 uh, age group and the 30 to the 49 age group. Mm -hmm. uh, in 60, it's identical, and in 64, there's only one percentage point difference. Okay. However, I think that compared to the older people, you might conclude that the younger individuals do tend to prefer the Democratic Party. In fact, we might agree with the conclusion on the slide that individuals of the 29, 21 to 29 age group do tend to prefer the Democratic Party. Let's take a look at the last social characteristic, political alienation level, and see if we can, from this data, make any conclusions about the relationship of that social characteristic and political party choice. Terry. Well, we have learned that uh, Negroes often have a feeling of alienation, and they often vote Democratic. And going along with that, uh, people, uh, well, Negroes and people of lower socioeconomic status and uh, manual workers and things, things like that usually tend to vote Democratic. Mm -hmm. And other college sense would tell you that the alienated people don't want anything to do with this system, so they won't vote at all. Maybe they won't vote at all. Any reaction to that? David? There's two different categories of uh, alienation. Like you had the uh, alienated dropout, which had just uh, had nothing to do with the political system, and then you had the uh, alienated activist who was so alienated and so fed up that he wants to uh, change. Mm -hmm. Do you have any category alienated voter in your data in the table, Terry? No, we don't. So you have to make uh, judgments based on these kinds of inferences rather than upon the hard and fast facts that you used in some of the other discussions. But uh, the comments you made were rather useful uh, concerning that. Uh, we have a moment to go, and perhaps you might like to make some statements which would help you to explain why individuals of upper socioeconomic status might tend to prefer the Republican Party, while individuals of lower status might tend to prefer the Democratic Party. Can you help us with that, Nancy? Well. The uh, Republican Party is more for big business, and it's, it, the Democratic Party is more for government-owned business, and this isn't as good for businessmen. Also, businessmen don't like as much federal aid and welfare programs because 
they sort of feel it. Well, it is their tax money that's being used, really, and so I think that's why the business then would prefer the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. uh, any other comments about why the relationship between socioeconomic status and voting choice prevails as we've seen it? Terry. Oh, well, it would seem that uh, in the Democratic Party, the tendency is to take in taxes and to take more money away from the richer people and uh, tax less the uh, poorer people, while um, that would be bad for the uh, Republicans, for the so people of upper socioeconomic status. The kinds of people that support the yeah. Republican Party. Uh, really? Well, I just to go along with him, but the um, uh, higher class people are usually a little more conservative than the lower class, because the lower class would be the one that's going to benefit from any government funds or anything that they put out. Mr. Patrick, that's a very interesting one. I wish I were in it. <laughs> uh, I agree with you. Very interesting indeed, and I was very pleased with the performance of the students. I felt that they showed a very, very good ability to use data and to uh, make factual judgments based on statistical data. I think they achieved the objectives that we set out to achieve. I particularly noticed how they were making some rather fine distinctions in a few places. Right. Uh, in, in a few places, they made distinctions beyond those that I anticipated they would make, and I was quite pleased with the effort that they made. I felt that uh, they did a good job in beginning to uh, offer explanations for the relationships that were described by the data. And uh, in future lessons, that's one of the things that we would uh, try to accomplish, uh, getting them to make statements of explanation that might account for the descriptive relationships that were shown by the data. There's another kind of thing that we would do in subsequent lessons, too. Uh, one of the things that we think is important for students to do is to indicate to both themselves and the teacher that they've really firmly learned concepts and generalizations that are part of this course. So we have a lesson called an application lesson, which would call for them to apply the kinds of generalizations that uh, they were learning today to a fresh situation, in most cases a case study. And if they were able to interpret the case study by using the generalizations and the concepts that were part of today's lesson, then they would indicate to both teacher and to themselves that learning indeed had taken place.